and welcome to Forgotten America, a podcast about the many places that get flown over, driven past, or just plain forgotten, and the people who call these places home. In each episode, we'll diagnose the unique challenges faced by rural America and unpack and explore the solutions to those challenges. We'll also share the culture, stories, and perspectives of forgotten Americans, from the hilltop to the holler and the desert to the delta. Peter J. Hill is Professor of Economics Emeritus at Wheaton College and a Senior Fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana, where he currently resides. He joins Garrett on Forgotten America to discuss free market environmentalism and the property rights framework he uses to evaluate conservation issues. PJ also gives us a look back into the truth about the Wild West and whether or not it was really all that wild. All right, PJ Hill, thank you for joining us today on this episode of Forgotten America. It's good to be with you. Now, I'm excited to talk to you because it's about a topic that, frankly, I feel is uh, greatly undercovered and under-discussed, and to some, may even sound like something of an oxymoron, and I'm talking about free market environmentalism, and you were really kind of one of the, the forerunners in the early uh, explainers of what that actually means. So first, would you mind explaining and defining environmentalism and then also explaining and explaining and defining what free market environmentalism is? Certainly. Um, environmentalism means a lot of different things. It can just mean concern for the environment, which is the same place that the organization that I work with, PERC, thinks about things. But as environmentalism has played out in the U.S., it usually means Markets have failed. We have to use top-down regulation. So let's pass some more laws. Let's have some more regulation. Let's try to restrict people's behavior in certain sorts of ways. Um, Free market environmentalism thinks about, well, can we get the incentives right? And can we give the decision makers on the ground appropriate information? So it's a much more bottom-up sort of a perspective. It doesn't mean no government involvement. It means government needs to try to get the property rights right, correct so that people face correct sorts of incentives to do the right sorts of things. And I can give you all sorts of examples, but I'll just stop there. And then you can try to pursue that a little bit farther. And I, I can tell you what we mean by free market environmentalism by thinking about in certain sorts of things. But it's really recognizing the rights and the interests and the trade-offs that the people on the ground face. And that's particularly important for rural America because most of the bureaucratic so, uh, solutions don't recognize the situations uh, or the particular situations that, that rural Americans are in. All right. So that's uh, there, we're, there are a number of threads throughout that response that we'll dive into a little bit deeper here. But first, Let's take on maybe some of the more cynical uh, reactions that people may have whenever they hear the term free market, free market environmentalism. Why do you think some people consider that phrase an oxymoron? And maybe why? Are, how are they wrong? Well, they think of markets as being at the heart of the problem. And, you know, if we have environmental problems, it's because markets have done wrong. You can see it that way, but it might be, I think, more accurate to say that markets were not given the opportunity uh, to do well because uh, the people that we want to reward for taking care of the environment uh, aren't being rewarded. And there are certain sorts of, you know, the world has changed. There are different sorts of trade-offs. And so we have to, we do have to recognize that and make some sorts of changes, but we have to think about it in terms mostly of providing people with better information, rather than just telling them what they have to do. Uh, For instance, uh, in 2001, the administration, the government changed the rule on arsenic. Most of us don't think about arsenic in water, but they changed the rule from 50 parts per billion to 10 parts per billion. Now, that seems like it would be a sensible thing. Turns out, even at 50 parts per billion, 
We don't have records that arsenic in water uh, creates, we don't have any uh, records that it creates health problems. Now that's interesting because about 18 miles west of me, me, uh, I'm in Western Montana. And there's a little town called Three Forks, Montana. Uh, it's uh, north of, of Yellowstone National Park. And because the Madison River comes out of these really interesting formations in the, in the park, it carries arsenic. So arsenic in uh, Three Forks, Montana is at about 67 parts per billion. It used to be pretty close to the limit of 50. At 10, they're going to have to put in you know, thousands of dollars to treat the water, even though there's not much evidence that it's going to make people healthier. People all along the Madison River don't have particular health problems. The ESA could have provided that information to the town of Three Forks and said, what would you like to do about it? Instead, they said, you've got to clean up the water. As I talked to the people in Three Forks, they'd a lot rather put their tax money into their local money, into improving the schools. They're willing to make certain trade-offs that the federal government, particularly at the ESA level, is unwilling to make. So it's really kind of giving that sort of incentive to the people on the ground. Another example um, with the Endangered Species Act is, say, Monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies, uh, the population has decreased a lot. Um, There's been a move to try to put the monarch butterfly on the endangered species list. Again, from my perspective, that's a top-down solution. Turns out that market um, monarch butterflies migrate. Uh, they one of their major food sources is milkweed, and milkweed has been taken out in certain areas by farmers because it's not particularly a productive crop. But if you got some milkweed around your barn, and monarch butterflies come by and are on it, you don't want them to be endangered species because at that moment you've just lost a lot of your property rights. You've now got an endangered species on your land. A much more sensible thing to do would be to say, you know, we like to have monarch butterflies. How would it be if we rewarded people for having milkweed? So maybe people don't plant, you know, 50 acres of milkweed, but maybe they allow milkweed to flourish or they got some places that they think would be a good place to put it in. And so they put in a half an acre or an acre of milkweed or they live, leave milkweed in. But that's a much more bottom up sort of a thing. Let's, let's recognize the people on the ground and the sorts of things that they're doing rather than trying to regulate from the top. Now, to me, that that kind of begs an interesting question, which is, and I think this is where a lot of times kind of free market people and those that are more uh, kind of progressive or top-down oriented kind of have a cleavage, is the fact that I think a lot of conservatives and libertarians, they think that the environment really only has a value in that it provides something to humanity, right? That there's there's value in the land because uh, people work it, they plant it, they sow it, they hike in it, they, um, they apply their own labor and improve it in some way. Progressives, at least to me, seem like there's an inherent value to the environment and that man should not trespass or disturb. And from that, a lot of these arguments kind of blossom. Is that accurate, or am I misreading this in some way? You're certainly capturing part of the thinking, and part of the modern environmental movement sees people as the problem. You know, we're, we're the curse of the earth. And if only you got people out of the way, then the, um, the natural word world returns to its balance. You get some sort of a pristine environment. That's somewhat different than people who are living and working in it uh, that see uh, a lot of good things about the world that they live in, the physical world. Uh, they respect it, but they also see all sorts of trade-offs. And the idea that people are the bane of the environment is I don't think that fits with how a lot of people on the ground are thinking and living. So there is that cleavage of, of people that would say, uh, and there have been some of the, you know, there's some of the more radical environment movement, but that say that people are the cancer. And if we get rid of people, then the environment is that thing that we're trying to uh, kind of preserve at all costs. Now, so far, you've mentioned a few phrases or words a few times that I think are really critical in this discussion. One is property rights, and the other is trade-offs. 
So how does the concept of private property rights and, and as well as trade-offs, how does that kind of undergird the argument for something like free market environmentalism? Why is that an important concept and why do people need to wrap their hands, their heads around trade-offs and property rights? Property rights really determine the actions that you can take with regard to a resource. So it makes you think seriously about what needs to be done and then kind of local uh, information, information held by the person actually controlling the resource. Do they want to make some changes or not make some changes? Oftentimes those changes are what economists would call on the margin or might not be necessarily something that somebody a long ways off would think about. So property rights are really essential. And one of the things that the free market environmentalism way of thinking, the way they go at it is to say that almost all environmental problems are really property rights problems, meaning the lack of defined and enforced and tradable property rights. If you have those, uh, then you have a way of dealing with problems. So the FME approach, free market environmentalist appro approach, says, well, let's figure out where the property rights are that are in contest. And then the approach is, well, is there a way we can assign those property rights or clarify them or lower the transaction costs of trading them? Uh, so, for instance, fisheries off of Alaska for years, uh, the only way you could have a property right in fish was to go out and catch fish. Well, uh, that uh, the, many of the fisheries were being overexploited because it's what we call the tragedy of the commons. People rush out to try to get the fish. They did create, it was a government sort of a program. In some countries, it's not by the government. For instance, in New Zealand, it's locally done. But in the U.S., they created uh, off the Alaska fishery what they called individual transferable quotas, or what you might call catch shares, in which a person got the right to catch. The, the biolog biologists would determine how, what was uh, the amount of fish take you could have a year and then and maintain the stock. In other words, keep it from depleting. So you would have that catch, uh, total catch in the year, and then you would assign it there is this question of whom do you assign it to, and usually what they do is use what they call a grandfathering clause. Uh, they assign it to the people who've been fishing there, and you know, say there's a million tons, and there's a certain number of fish that can be caught in a year. You just assign that catch share to different vessels or different owners who've traditionally been in there. So they get a percentage of that catch. Uh, they can sell it, they can rent it, they can consolidate it, they can break it up. And it turns out that that lowers the transaction cost. It's a property right in the ability to catch fish. And you don't have to go out and catch during a stormy time or in a few days, which is what happened with the halibut fishery in Alaska, because uh, you know that you can wait and any time during the fishing season, you can take it. So that's a case of it's actually government involvement, but it's government creating a property right that then allows the people that own it to decide how they want to use it and make the trade-offs that they think are appropriate. So <clears throat> what happens in the absence, and you had mentioned one scenario, the tragedy of the commons, but what, haps, what happens in the absence of property rights uh, sort of in the environmental uh, and economic intersection? Well, it, uh, if you have to use up the resource immediately, and, or if you, the only way you can claim it is to take it, then that is the tragedy of the commons. And historically, in those sorts of cases, uh, not in all cases, but uh, there is, you will find that it gets overused. Now, if you can use local sorts, people like to solve the problem of the commons and because they understand that it exists. And so they try to solve that sort of a problem. Many times it means allowing them to define and enforce their particular property rights to the resource. But yeah, you have to figure out some way of allowing people to postpone consumption and still have a right to it. So that's just, that's what's going on there. Uh, you can see that in, uh, for instance, oil fields for a period of time. Um, underground oil could be accessed from lots of different points. And so lots of people put in wells to try to get the oil out as quickly as possible. 
That was uh, been solved by some, or made much less of a problem by unitization, where they agree as to what the amount of oil is and what shares can be taken out. Um, so uh, on the open range, cattle ranchers uh, actually assigned grazing rights on their own, uh, a local group, and they enforced that. Uh, this I'm talking about 1880s, 1890s, 1900 uh, on the Great Plains, and they enforced that by allowing access to roundups. If you grows, if you rose, if you grazed more cattle than what was a what your right was, then you couldn't be a part of the community roundup. And being a part of the community roundup was pretty important on the open range. So those sorts of things are the ways that we think about in terms of getting the property rights correct. Well, that's fascinating. Um, one of the things that we often see in, in a place like West Virginia or Eastern Kentucky, and I'm sure in some other places across the country is this idea or this narrative that if you allow the privatization of land or resources, what ends up happening is essentially a, kind of a, how do I want to put this, uh, kind of a raping of the resource, right? Or a, a raping of the land. And a lot of the examples in West Virginia is something like mountaintop removal. And so what ends up happening is kind of these battles between coal companies and environmental groups. The environmental groups say, well, there's a lot of uh, kind of mental effects on something uh, caused by mountaintop removal. You know, people kind of get depressed. The kind of the beauty of the land is being degraded. The coal companies say, well, we're simply responding to the market. Uh, we're not doing anything inherently evil or anything like that. This is simply the more economical way to get to coal. Where do you come down on that as an economist? Should we should we imbue more value or value outside of monetary value to something like land? How would an economist approach the problem of something like mountaintop removal? I don't know the exact property rights there, but if the coal companies have clear property rights to to that land, the mountaintop, then it, given the property rights structure that we have in place, they generally have the ability to take it off. Now, if there's water pollution, if it changes the environment for people uh, lower on the mountain downstream, then that's, you could call that uh, an unclear property right or a la well, lack of a well-defined property right, and maybe you need to do something about that. The basic question, though, is, is there a way for the people that disagree to express their preferences? And we're finding that in the West, that some of the resources that are government owned, uh, you can, uh, the um, people, conservationists can't really express their preferences by bidding against the timber companies or the ranchers who have leases on federal land. So one of the questions I would ask with regard to Virginia or to West Virginia would be, what about the environmentalists or conservationists actually rewarding the coal company for leaving um, is, is there a transferable resource there? If they think that the mountaintop is valuable, is there a way to pay them to leave it in place? Is there a, pay, a way to uh, reward them for only removing part of it? Is there a way to reward them for restoring some of the uh, amenity resources? So that's uh, the free market environmentalism approach says, is there a way of allowing the expression of different preferences? And it is true that over time, um, as we get richer as a society and as we understand more about ecological concerns, people care more about amenity resources, about views, those sorts of things. They should have to, there should be a way of allowing them to express that through the marketplace, uh, which would mean transferable property rights. So I know, I know oftentimes economists are hesitant to, to kind of offer up normative judgments, but, you know, what responsibility do private actors have on being good stewards of the environment, right? So it's this question of should, you know, do you think that private companies should try to internalize the cost of their externalities, essentially? Should they think about the concerns of you know, what it looks like or what it does to the landscape, right? What it does to the natural beauty of the environment um, by engaging in something like mountaintop removal. So kind of take that where you want to, but I, I'm really fascinated by the question of should as it relates to the private responsibilities. Well, I think it's 
um, unfortunate when economists want to say, you know, we don't deal with moral issues. We do all the time. There are our moral claims behind every property rights claim. And so uh, I don't think we should ignore those, but trying to regulate those from the top down, particularly from the national level, has all sorts of issues. Um, the coal companies should take account of the things that are valuable. If there is no way for them to be rewarded for uh, taking into account for amenity resources, uh, we can we can use persuasion. We can try to get them to do it. Uh, but if if there is a group of people that disagree with how a resource is being used, one of the best sorts of things to do is to allow them to rent it, to buy it. Uh, one of the great examples is the Hawk Mountain Preserve in uh, western Pennsylvania, that clear back in the 1920s. It was being used by hunters. Uh, it's, it's part of the Appalachian Flyway, and uh, so both in the fall and the spring, it was a great place to hunters to go to be up on Hawk Mountain and shoot raptors. Well, Rosalie Edge was a person who was gravely concerned about the shooting of raptors. And so she leased, she was able to get a person to lease, the, the who owned Hawk Mountain, to lease it to her. And then she finally put together enough money to buy it. And so she preserved it by buying it. And Hawk Mountain is now a great bird watching place. Uh, but it was because of private entrepreneurs and a transferable sort of a property right. So they just bought the right away from the hunters on behalf of the bird watchers. And that's the sort of a thing that you want to be able to do to allow the preferences particularly change. I think one of the issues is the world is changing. It's particularly changing for rural America. But we want to be careful not to try to impose an outside view on rural America. We should allow those people to be making decisions themselves about rural America. So uh, let's see. Uh, what, I always ask this question to people that have kind of a, an interest in just environmental economics or ecology or um, well, even just pro property rights theory. But what are your thoughts on Rachel Carson and Silent Spring? Good question. Um, a book was published here uh, by, by, Hort, by uh, Perk Scholars on it. I have to go back and... Uh, look at it and, you know, find out more. I read it at one point, and that's been some time ago. The um, idea that, uh, again, um, that if humans are the problem can come out. Uh, there's one part of Rachel Carson that I found uh, very appropriate, and that was what I would call awe, respect for the environment, uh, or for the natural world, appreciation of beauty in the in the natural world. The idea, though, that then you can have a kind of a national bureaucracy that's going to try to recognize those sorts of things, I think it's far better to say, well, what are the property rights? What are the property rights to this particular land that, bird, that birds are using or that insects are on? And is there a way of allowing people that care about it to rent it, to buy it up, to pay people not to use it up in ways that um, they find to be inimical to a good environment. In much of the um, northern plains, there are what are called prairie potholes, and they're nesting areas for uh, migratory ducks. Uh, and for some period of time, farmers were, far if you got it at the right time of year, uh, you could, uh, when it was dry, you could farm through those prairie potholes and then put in uh, new grasses. And so the potholes could, would be filled in. But Ducks Unlimited and other groups discovered that they could go to farmers and they could actually lease a pothole. They could pay the farmer, hey, that pothole is only one acre out of your uh, 500 acres. We will pay you not to farm through it. We will lease it from you because we want those potholes to be filled with water uh, during the time of year when the birds are coming through and when they're nesting. And that was a way of allowing that preference to be expressed. It was an appropriate sort of a way, and it worked pretty well. So that's the sort of a thing that FME, free market environmentalism, thinks about. Is there a way of resolving conflict by exchange, by purchase, by renting, uh, by doing all of those sorts of things? 
And as people become more concerned about certain environmental issues, then we can say, well, let's offer you the opportunity to take advantage of that by giving you the mechanism by which you can rent, by which you can purchase. Uh, You can do all of those sorts of things. Is environmentalism basically a luxury good? And you'll know what I mean by that as an economist. Uh, Some parts of it are. It, It certainly is... If you're uh, reasonably well off living in the city, it's pretty easy to look at um, a farmer uh, trying to make a living and saying, you know, I wish that they wouldn't be doing certain sorts of things so I can think about uh, how beautiful the environment is. So I think it's a luxury good at some level uh, for particularly people who don't have to pay the cost, it becomes a little less of a luxury good if you're making the trade-offs yourself. And that's where I think that uh, environmentalism needs to go. Uh, You need to say to people that care about those sorts of things, well, here's an opportunity for you to put your money where your mouth is. For instance, here uh, in Montana, uh, all across the West, about 40% of the land is owned by government. Now, I know that's not the case back where you are, but huge amounts of, of land owned by the federal government. There's a lease program where farmers can lease it uh, for their cattle. There's a lease program where uh, timber users can harvest it for timber. Uh, One of the problems of the leasing program set up by the federal government is you have to use it. You can't get a a federal lease on most of that. Uh, It's called use it or lose it. You can't get a federal lease to harvest trees and not harvest the trees. You can't get a grazing permit and not graze. So what we've suggested is, well, if people really care about those sorts of things, let's change the federal rules. Let's allow environmental groups to get involved and to purchase or rent the right to trees for a period of time to keep it from being harvested. Uh, When timber is put up for lease and they put it up for bid, allow environmental group to bid on it and not harvest the trees. Uh, Allow environmental group to bid on a grazing lease and not use it. So those are the sorts of things where we can think about kind of on the margin, are there ways for expression of this thing that you're calling a luxury good? And one of the ways of finding out is asking people are they willing to pay for it or not. Yeah, I was honestly, when I was thinking of of that question, I was almost thinking in terms of kind of first world vis-a-vis third world. Right. Right. And and so you have kind of rich, already, quote unquote, developed nations setting kind of a a climate agenda for countries and areas of the world that are still essentially uh, burning dung and mud and and things that are absolutely, and wood, things that are absolutely terrible from an environmental perspective, yet they're not being allowed to develop in the same way and in the same path that the current first world has developed. Yes, that's that's, uh, an ongoing issue. And we have to be careful not to try to impose our judgment on on them. It is the case that there's something called the environmental Kuznets curves. And for most things, not for everything, but most what we think of as environmental goods, actually, during a period of development, uh, the environment may become more polluted for a period of time. And then as you get richer, it becomes less, because it turns out that people do value the environment. But so uh, around, say, three to seven thousand dollars per capita income, that curve starts to move from environmental degradation to environmental improvement. And that's a that's a thing that we want to encourage. Uh, So one of the interesting sorts of things as we think about environmental issues is we don't want to make it too costly uh, for a poor country to try to develop, because one of the sorts of things that happens is you get richer, uh, you start caring more about the environment. So we should allow countries to take reasonable action with regard to economic growth. Economic growth in most countries is going to be one of the best things that can happen uh, to environmental quality. So a two-part question here. One, what led you into this particular field. You're a University of Chicago trained economist. Obviously, that has a very well-established reputation for producing great thinkers of of free market economics, not necessarily environmental economics. And then second to that is for people that are interested in this subject, are there any early pioneers or thinkers or scholars on free market environmentalism 
or books or essays that you would point to that you would point to for people interested in learning a little bit more for, on, on a reading level? Now, part of from my background, part of it's just you know kind of accidental. I've had a career as a cattle rancher in Montana as well as an academic with my PhD in economics. So through most of my life, I've operated a working cattle ranch. And so that has given me you know, at least some concern for what I would call the natural world. And I've had to face trade-offs. I've had to, you know, it's, it's great to think about how romantic cattle ranching is, but on a, uh, when you've got a wet snow in May and you've got baby calves coming and they're being frozen because of the snow, then all of a sudden you start thinking a little differently about, well, maybe we would like to have some ways to try to deal with those sorts of issues uh, that involve technology, that involve increases in income. So part of it is that I have spent a lot of my time out of doors, but my out of doors world hasn't been so much hiking or uh, backpacking or skiing. Uh, it's been moving cattle. It's been calving heifers. It's been putting up hay, doing those sorts of things. So that's given me a perspective, I think, that makes me think about the environment from a from what I would call a property rights uh, bottom-up uh, perspective. In terms of thinkers, there is an economist, passed away very recently, called Ronald Coase. He is kind of the, one of, I think, one of the best people to go to in terms of some of the theory of transaction costs. If you want a little more practical sort of a thing, Terry Anderson, uh, who's been was with Perk for many years, uh, has a book called Free Market Environmentalism. It's with Don Leo, and there's about they've, they've published several different editions of it. But anybody that's interested in uh, environmental issues from that perspective, just check out the book Free Market, Free Market Environmentalism. Terry Anderson is uh, listed as the first author, and then or partially because his name starts with A. But uh, you will find in there all sorts of examples of how FME can can help to solve certain sorts of problems. So that would be one of the places I would start. The other sort of a thing I would say is go to the website uh, for the Property and Environment Research Center, PERC, P-E-R-C. If you look at our webpage, you can put in water, you can put in, 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 in just search for Endangered Species Act, you can put in elk, you can you know put in uh, monarch butterflies. You can, you know, just look through the things. We publish a lot of stuff that takes up real world problems and then says, well, how can you think about that from an incentives and information perspective? What about barn owls? I, I feel like I, I remember something dealing with the, uh, the Endangered Species Act in the Pacific Northwest somewhere. And there was a theory that was put forth that it was logging or timbering or, or ranchers up in the Pacific Northwest were basically causing uh, basically the barn owl, I think it was a barn owl, to go nearly extinct. And as it turns out, it was another predatory bird. Is that rigging any bells? Yes, it does. It's, it's really the spotted, uh, spotted owl, not the barn owl. Uh, but some questions about is it even a separate species or is it kind of a subspecies? But yeah, there was... Logging was stopped in much of the Pacific Northwest because of the of this danger to the spotted owl. As we've come back, it turns out, or if we looked at it more, a lot of other sorts of things going on. That's not a straightforward sort of an example. Uh, it became kind of a, an issue in which some environmentalists said, we're really great for, grateful for the spotted owl because it enabled us to shut down logging. If it wouldn't have been there, we would have had to invent it because they wanted to use it not for the purpose necessarily of trying to protect the bird. That was probably a secondary concern. But they wanted to, they wanted to stop logging on public lands. Again, uh, what you need is a mechanism for people that care about that to actually bid it up. We have an example of that here uh, outside of Bozeman. Actually, this is on state land. But a, a housing development at the edge of town, uh, up above them was an area of land owned by the state of Montana. They were thinking about putting it up for a timber lease. lease. The people in that housing area actually got together, said, we like the land. We would prefer that it not be logged. And they bid for it and got the timber lease. It was not terribly expensive per household. And so that was a sort of a thing that works more from a bottom up sort of a perspective. Are you familiar with Edward Abbey? 
we had one of our previous uh, podcast guests really uh, suggested for our listeners, if, if they're inter- interested in sort of the problems of public land policies and things like that, that they look at uh, Edward Abbey, who was kind of a, he was an environmental advocate, but um, something of an anarchist and then also a, a huge critic of public land use policies, but he was a man of the left. And so he, he brought kind of an interesting perspective to, to that debate. Are you familiar with Edward Abbey? I am. It's been some time since I've looked at him. Uh, but yes, he would say that many of the problems come by because of kind of the de- development perspective at any cost that has been pursued by the federal government, particularly through the first half of the 20th century. And so he would look at lots of dams that were put in, uh, the idea of subsidizing timber harvests, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, So you're right. He's been very critical of federal government actions. Uh, He is a, a, a person of the left. So uh, that would be that would be one place to go. Uh, I find his, uh, in some sense, uh, he just wants to he wants to change who controls the levers of power. I would be much more uh, inclined to figure out can we take those levers of power from the national level, in some cases take them to the federal level and or to the uh, use federalism, but take them to the state level or to the local level. So I find his concerns appropriate. I don't think that I come out the same place as he does in terms of solutions. If anybody's interested in that episode, that's with uh, J.D. to Chile, and that was released back in, let's see, June of this year called Self-Reliance and Anarchy in the Arizona Wilderness. So if anybody's interested in listening to a little bit more about that, please, by all means, check that out. So just a few questions left for you, PJ, and we're going to transition a little bit away from kind of FME discussion here. But I noticed as I was researching uh, for this interview, you've written quite a bit about the American West and, uh, and perhaps in ways that people would find surprising. Tell me why you're interested in the American West and maybe some of the more common misconceptions and what your research found to the contrary. Certainly. Well, part of it, again, comes out of my background. Of, you know, my, my grandfather rode from Denver to Montana in 1892. Not very many people in Montana in 1892, one of the last areas to be developed. He started our cattle ranch in 1894. So and that's the ranch that my, my family had that I operated for many years. Uh, so there's just kind of that natural interest in it. But I'm also kind of an uh, economic historian, uh, interested in how things have played out in the American West. So 19th century American West is generally seen as this great place of disorder. No law and order. Uh, the federal government wasn't present in any great form. So it must have been a place where it was uh, shoot them up. And that's a lot of what TVs and novels uh, have said and have kind of given us this picture uh, of the West as, as this place of disorder. Terry Anderson and I have written about that. We have a book called The Not-So-Wild, Wild West, Property Rights on the Frontier. And in it, we argue that bottom up, the Westerners, the settlers, uh, did find ways of producing order. Uh, if you look at the Native American populations, now I would say that the Native Americans were not well treated by the settlers. So this is not a case that the settlers got everything right. But the Native American populations also devised ways of trying to uh, have command over resources. Um, they had fish traps on in the Pacific Northwest, in irrigation facilities. They had clear property rights. So the West is not a place where uh, disorder dominated. Uh, you can, for instance, take the case of the bank robbery. You know, the idea is that a bunch of uh, desperados ride into town, tie their horses to the hitching post, march into the bank, look at the cowering teller and say, we want your money. So they take their money, throw it in the saddlebags, and they ride out of town. If you look at the actual data from 1860 to 1900, there's only there's less than a dozen bank robberies in all of the West. So that's just one of the sorts of things that made for popular popular fiction ideas. Uh, you can ask why. Well, one of the things was that every household in the West during that period of time, in these small towns particularly, every household was armed. 
Now, it wasn't necessarily a sidearm. It was a rifle or a shotgun that you kept behind the door or over the top of the door. You used it to you, to kill uh, predatory varmints, to put down a steer that had broken its leg. And so you can imagine the idea of uh, some uh, bank robberies coming into town. Let's uh, say it's a town of a thousand people. And the uh, rumor goes through the town, hey, the bank is being robbed. Well, they're going to have to ride out and they're going to have to ride by 40 different households, each which is armed. What do you think happens to the bank robbers? Well, they get shot out of the saddle. There's a pretty good reason why bank robbery was not a a very prominent sort of a thing. There were actually more stagecoach robberies than there were bank robberies. Uh, Local people cared about protecting property rights um, and they did a pretty good job. So we can look at that for lots of different things. We can look at that for mining claims. We can look at that for wagon trains as they went across the West uh, in the latter part of the 1840s after gold discovery in California. Uh, We can look at it for trailing cattle from Texas to Montana, uh, the open range, all of those sorts of questions. And we find in almost every case uh, that basically people figured out a way to produce order. Fantastic. So just a a couple questions left here. So when I was kind of, again, researching for this interview, I came across the statement from Pete Betke, and he says about you, there are very few special teachers of economics. Paul Hain was one, Ken Elzing another, and PJ Hill is another. What was it about teaching? What is it about teaching that... uh, you love, what, what is it about sort of the transfer of knowledge from you to your students that you find so attractive? And um, just talk a little bit about your career in the classroom. Well, I think that economics is a useful way of thinking. It's, it's a way of thinking about trade-offs. It's a way of thinking about people and their desires. It's really a study of the social coordination process and how can we figure out ways to cooperate And there's good ways to cooperate with a system of well-defined property rights and prices. So my career was built around trying to communicate that. And a lot of it was actually communicating it with undergraduates. I taught at Montana State for a period of time. I had both undergraduates and graduates. Uh, Then the last 25 years of my career, I taught at Wheaton College, a Christian liberal arts college in the western suburbs of Chicago. I was actually there for a meeting this last week, and interestingly enough, Ken Elzingo was there. He's an economist at the University of Virginia, uh, and he was our speaker at a meeting. He has some of the same sort of a vision that I do, that communicating the economics, particularly to undergraduates, is a worthwhile endeavor. And I actually enjoyed the very, very first course in economics, principles of economics, or sometimes it's taught as principles of microeconomics. And it was a delight to work with um, interesting students, students that cared about learning. Uh, so I had a, I would, I'm just grateful that I had the opportunity to have that as a part of my career was communicating this world of trade-offs and uh, how we can cooperate, identifying the areas where our cooperation breaks down, and then thinking about ways in which we can try to solve those sorts of problems. And it usually means uh, seeing is there a property rights problem, and is there a way we can and we can lower the transaction costs of people cooperating? So, for those who've never taken an economics class, is there one concept that you feel like if everyone knew this concept, um, it would create the most value or would uh, illuminate uh, a certain debate perhaps better than any other concept? What's the one concept in economics? that you recommend people really learn and um, take to heart? Certainly one of them would be that, and I'm going to give you a couple of them, that a system of well-defined and enforced property rights actually moves power from the center to to the real people on the ground. But they need to be able to communicate their desires and their abilities and their differences. And we do that through prices. So a system of property rights and prices is a system of encouraging people to look for ways of advantaging other people. Can we do something that helps other people? And that's really what markets are all about. There there are a system of rewarding people who find ways of helping other people. So that's a good sort of a thing. It doesn't mean that non-price mechanisms or non-price ways of helping people are wrong. It just means that societies that have figured out how to do this add to 
the non-price ways of helping people, and they use prices and property rights of ways of communicating and coordinating and cooperating with other people. Fantastic. I'll, I'll also just put a quick plug in for the knowledge problem. <laughs> just Google the knowledge problem. I think that's a, a fascinating concept. And frankly, I think as a, as a society, I, I think we've done a disservice by not teaching more economics, at least requiring a kind of an econ 101 in high school and college. Um, if, if nothing else, microeconomics can help answer or at least provide one with context on so many different debates. And I think it's a shame that we've not done that. I would agree, but then that's my perspective as an economist who has uh, had a delightful time of teaching economics uh, to students over the years. All right, this is my last question or, or my next to last question. It's probably my most controversial, PJ. Which part of Montana is better, eastern or western? Ah, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have a get a hard time for me answering that one. I grew up on the Great Plains. The eastern two thirds of Montana is the Great Plains. In a lot of ways, that's where I grew up, where I was, what I've lived with. And so I like that. I now live in western Montana, and I like the mountains. Um, I like seeing snow on the mountains, um, all of those sorts of things. I guess for me, I'd still go back to the Great Plains, uh, the rolling plains, the short grass prairies. And um, that's uh, there. one of the reasons I like it is there's uh, a lot more people directly involved in production, uh, in agricultural life. And I just find that's a, a group of people that I identify with uh, more. Montana's getting quite a few people that move in just for the scenery. And I understand that or for the recreation. I understand that. And that's uh, something that markets can take account of. Uh, but my heart still goes with the uh, on the ground agricultural producers. All right, fantastic. How do people? What are you doing today? What are you? Are you working on any big projects? Are you enjoying re retirement? Kind of. What are you working on now? I just came back from a trip to Michigan and uh, to Illinois. I was at Wheaton College uh, in Illinois. Uh, I think at this point uh, I'm going to try to uh, get uh, hoses disconnected. We're starting to freeze here, so we're just taking care of our household. By the way, my ranch. I'm no longer. Uh, the, the cattle rancher that I was. I've been retired for 10 years and I now live on nine acres. Uh, before that, I was ranching on 1,500 acres. Before that, for most of my life, I was ranching on 25,000 acres. So it's been a real change for me to go from that 25,000 acre ranch to the 1,500 acre ranch to the nine acre uh, little household that I now have. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Well, PJ Hill, thank you so much for a, a fascinating conversation and introduction into free market environmentalism. I hope people will go out there, explore this topic a little bit deeper. Uh, thank you for joining us, sir. PJ Hill, Senior Research Fellow at PERC and Professor of Economics Emeritus at Wheaton College. Thank you for joining us today on this episode of Forgotten America. Thank you. I enjoyed the time. Thanks for joining us for this week's conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to Forgotten America wherever you get your podcasts. If you liked this episode, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you would like to support the production of this podcast, you can become a patron of the Cardinal Institute on Patreon or donate at www.cardinalinstitute.com donate.